Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Claudia Rizzini. I'm the Executive Director of the Rackley Fellowship Program at Harvard University. Today's presentation is by Omer Aziz. Omer is a writer, author, journalist, lawyer, and former foreign policy advisor in the administration of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The thread that weaves together these varied career achievements is Omer's love for knowledge and its ability to open windows to the wider world. In his recently released memoir, Brown Boy, Omer chronicles the obstacles he encountered and continues to overcome in pursuit of education. As a first-generation Pakistani Muslim born into a working-class family in Toronto, he has con contended with the desire of belonging in white elitist spaces that never fully accept him. Omer's story of alienation and the difficulties of crafting, um, sorry, crafting an identity in the Western world elucidate the rage, fear, and visceral sense of exclusion felt by those who are cast as others in society. During his, Ratcliffe, uh, time, during his time at Radcliffe, Omer is working to complete Fascism in America, a non-fiction book that interlays the personal and the political. Blending reportage and personal experiences with historical, legal, and sociological analysis, Omer crafts a modern-day retelling of Alexis de Tocqueville's seminal work, Democracy in America. Told from his, his uniquely multidimensional voice, Omer traces the evolution of fascism and the far right in America, arguing that liberal democracies democracy have been and continues to be mirrored by the presence of racial supremacy. By examining the authoritarian threads woven into American society, these essays challenge the popular fiction we tell ourselves in the Western world about democracy, equality, and freedom. And now let's hear from our Catherine A. and Mary C. Gellert Fellow, Omer Aziz. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Claudia, for that very kind introduction. Thank you to all of you for joining me today. You know, before I start, I am gonna show a video very quickly, but I do wanna answer the question of why I even pursued this project. You see, when I was growing up, I was told a lot of myths about the West, that it was the bastion of the Enlightenment and the age of reason and of civilized society. And I agreed with a lot of that. I went to some of the best schools, I'm here at Harvard, but I never quite understood how it was that the West, about 90 years ago, had sent its most assimil assimilated, its most productive minority to the gas chambers. How had that happened? How had it happened that civilized, enlightened societies like Germany and like Italy had descended into the worst forms of barbarism and savagery that we had seen? Perhaps the roots of the problem didn't start in 1930. Perhaps the roots of this ideology we call fascism went a little deeper. And perhaps it was here in America as well. <laughs> 
those who don't know, that is from 1939, infamous New York City rally of fascists, neo-Nazis, not neo-Nazis, excuse me, actual Nazis, organized by the German Bund. And I think some of the symbolism there, there's a lot that I can tell you in this presentation, but there's some things that I just have to show you, right? Because fascism operated and operates with symbology, with narrative, and with certain aesthetics. And some of the symbolism there that you can see of George Washington and the flag would be very, very important. But before we understand what's going on right now, I think we need to take it all the way back. I want to lay out a definition very quickly because I think this is a core point that critics will jump on. Well, fascism is a term that everyone uses. It's used in online discourse and it's not really defined. What is fascism? I define it as a far right ideology. It's not a far left ideology as some critics have said. It's nationalistic, aggressively nationalistic. It's anti-democratic. Right? There's a difference between being a nationalistic conservative and being a fascist. It embodies and glorifies the traditional masculine. It has a great nostalgia for the past. And it exercises a certain war over culture. And this is a theme that's going to come up in this presentation and I hope in the discussion, in the ways in which fascists use culture, use art, use language to essentially dominate the polity before they take over power. As Mussolini said, the fascist conception is a spiritual one arising from the general reaction of the century against the materialistic positivism of the 19th century. Basically, it's a reactionary ideology. And no matter how we cut it, no matter how we slice it, no matter which example we look at, and over here we're gonna look at the United States, Nazism, and a little bit of Italy, whether we look at Spain, whether we look at Vichy France, there's always an other. In theory, and from a very theoretical standpoint, fascism could be state-based. Of course, Mussolini had said, only the state, nothing but the state, nothing outside of the state, but in practice, fascism leads to the marginalization and the demonization of an other, always. And one of the things I learned about more in my research about Nazism and Hitler's Germany was the virulent anti-Semitism, of course, that targeted the Jewish people, but also the anti-black racism, the targeting of what we would today call trans people, the targeting of intellectually disabled people, and of course, immigrants and foreigners. So regardless of who exactly the other is, it'll transform, but it's always there. The interwar years, of course. This is a thesis, a provocation that I put up in my first book that just came out. And I, you know, I, I, I want someone to try and challenge it. If one part of the legacy of the West was the Enlightenment, here was the other white supremacy and fascism put into practice. Fascism was not just in the recent past of the West, it was practically tradition. Nazism in particular was the mutation and is the mutation of fascism that I am most interested in because of its focus on racial supremacy and of course it being the ultimate evil that we can conceive of. So I found some headlines and one of the things I found was that People here, and most people of course were white and they weren't of a minority group that would be persecuted by this individual, didn't really take his rise too seriously. They just kind of shrugged it off. Hitler's anti-Semitism, not so violent or genuine as it sounded, New York Times. This is a professor of mine from Yale Law School who is um, building on this thesis, this idea that basically the Nazis are operating within the Western tradition. They're not some evil demonic group that emerged out of nowhere. That's very easy for us and self-satisfying for us to believe, but they're operating within the Western tradition. And this is something that I wrote a few years ago, just looking at the legal relationship between what the Nazis learned, what the Nazis implemented in their policy and what they took from the United States. Some of the Nazi inspirations actually surprised me. Hitler writes about this in Mein Kampf and it's cited in the War in the East, the original racial supremacy. Point by point, he studied and they studied and took great fascination in the American conquest of indigenous and Indian lands. That was the premise of Lebensraum or living space in the East, the Wild West mythology. Hitler was a huge fan of the cowboy myth, which was also a racial supremacist myth. American domination over blacks, of course, second-class citizenship. Another thing that surprised me, the British Empire. Hitler and his cronies look out at what are called free white men's democracies in the early 1900s, not just the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. These are all states that have a racial caste system based upon white supremacy. America, of course, is the apogee of that and the example of a racial supremacist state at this time par excellence. Going through more of the headlines, um, 
No one's apparently surprised. And this is one thing that was perhaps surprising to me, given how history went afterwards, was that all of this was written about. Like, there was nothing here that was a secret. The party program in 1919, it says very, very clearly, only members of the nation may be a state. Accordingly, no Jew may be a member of the nation. It was very, very clearly written. But one thing that wasn't so clear was that how this individual was able to gain power. Now, in my research, I'm very interested in the early period of Nazism and fascism because this is the transition period, right? This is where in Italy, a democracy goes to a fascist state in the 1920s. And in Germany, it goes from a weak democracy, Weimar, into a full-blown fascist Nazi state very, very quickly. So 1939 and 1945 is not exactly the focus of my project. My focus is on the early part of the history to see how that transition happens. And one of the things I've learned through my research was that it really came down to the 30 days before Hitler assumed power in the backroom deals that happened um, in, uh, in Berlin at the time. And that shows that at any point before that, this actually could have been stopped. And that the people in the room, the decisions that they make are pivotal. This is another really interesting thing. This is also from Professor Hen the late Professor Henry Ashby Turner of Yale University, that no one who appointed Hitler chancellor had read any of his work in the room. They hadn't consulted any of the experts. They actually didn't know who they were getting into bed with, so to speak. This is super interesting as well. The German electoral history leading up to the Nazi ascension of power. Remember, Hitler takes power January 30th, 1933, 90 years ago this past January. And they weren't really doing that well. You know, the 1928 election, only 3% of the vote. Less than 3% of the vote, but they begin to build momentum. 1930 election, 18.4% of the vote. 1932 election, it goes up again. And there's another election in 1932, but the Nazi party is going down at this point. They're losing seats, and through various backroom deals, Hitler is appointed chancellor. This is my first lesson. When the fascists do get into power, they learn where the levers of control are and how to exercise them they can and will transform the polity very quickly. January 30th, 1933 is a pivotal date in the 20th century. Hitler's appointed chancellor. Then there's the Reichstag fire in February. The Enabling Act is passed in March. And by summer, there is no more German democracy. And one can argue this is a weak democracy. This was a democracy fated to fail, but I wouldn't bet too much on that argument either. Germany also had a proud tradition of not just militarism, but a legal culture as well. The, the legal German tradition went back hundreds of years. And this is why it was important, because Hitler actually didn't proclaim a new constitution. He was operating within the Weimar Constitution. But of course, Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution gives power to presidential rule by presidential decree. This is one of my core conclusions, I think, early on. I just want to state this. I was thinking about how a lot of right-wing politicians, and we'll come to this, they focus on the Marxists and the communists and basically a non-entity. I think this is one difference between communism as an uh, idea and movement and fascism as an idea and movement. Communism launches the revolution and then it wins power. I think of Lenin, party state, I think of 1917, whereas fascism wins power first, then it launches a revolution. It's very different, right? After Hitler's fair, failed beer hall butch attempt, butch attempt, they learn, the Nazis learn, you have to be quiet and you have to win power first. I wanna go back to 1933 for a second and what the Nazis learned about America because the common narrative is that America went into Europe and saved Europe from Nazism and fascism, which is totally false. But going back to 1933, something very interesting happens in the Prussian ministry after Hitler's already taken power, which is that a memorandum circulates among Nazi lawyers, and what are they studying and looking at in this memorandum? They're studying American race law. And the very first thing that is cited in that memorandum and in that meeting is American race law over Jim Crow. The 1933 Prussian Memorandum lays out what would become the Nuremberg Laws, the first law less known about the flag law, which based the swastika, the national flag of Germany, and better known about the citizenship law and the blood law, essentially forbidding Jews from becoming citizens and criminalizing marriage between Jews and Germans. 
Very interesting encounter that happens around this time at this meeting. Dr. Mobius, who's a Nazi doctor working for the Interior Ministry, talks to State Secretary uh, Roland Friesler. He says, I'm reminded of something an American said to us recently. He explained, we do the same thing you are doing, but why do you have to say it so explicitly in your law? Friesler responded, but the Americans put it in their own laws even more explicitly. This is the, the operative passage from Mein Kampf, and what Hitler is referring to here in particular is America's racially restrictive immigration laws. As we will see, the Nazis didn't just look at the Jim Crow law and segregation, they also studied American race law, American law to do with indigenous people, American colonial law, and laws around marriage and property as well. This is from a global history. I mean, there are so many things like this. I don't want to don't continue beating this point, but I think it's an important one that the actual policymakers of the Nazi regime learned a lot from the United States because America was the world leader of race law at that time. And this was a startling conclusion Professor Whitman had as well, Yale Law School. He not only found that the Nazis studied American race law, he found that the most radical Nazis were the most aggressive champions of that race law. And at times, the Nazis actually thought American law around the one drop rule and other forms of segregation was actually too harsh. You have to be reminded that the one drop rule would have classified, the reason why it wasn't put into statute or into any laws or into any constitution was because, as strict as it was, as soon as that was put into legislation, many white people would be considered black. And in the end, Nazi lawyers and jurists rejected American race law for being too extreme. A little bit of history here, I think most people would know this. In 1691, Virginia adopts America's first race-based and anti-miscegenation statute. 1791, the very first Congress in their very first immigration law passed said that only free, quote, white persons could immigrate to the United States. Alex taught us yesterday about eugenics, and eugenics wasn't just operative in music, but in basically all fields, in all fields of policy, in everything to do with the human being at the time, and of course, America was the leader in eugenics research. And the eugenics movement at this time, again, in the 1920s, leads to this Immigration Restriction Act of 19, 1924. One of the latest immigration restriction acts sets a racial restrictive quota on, uh, on immigration, bans entire populations, and basically America has a racist immigration policy until all the way until 1965. The way it has racist policy with marriage all the way until Loving versus Virginia in 1967. Very, very, very late. And this is the actual bill itself. It says right up top, those that any alien other than an alien enemy being a free white person. So that's super interesting when we talk about white supremacy, right? Because often critics say, well, it's, it's just this generic vague term, and yet there it is in the Congress. And we'll see that term comes up again and again. This Indian gentleman, in a case that has not been taught in law school, and this is a, a, a bone I have to pick with our law professors and curriculum makers, because neither Johnson versus McIntosh, which is the major Supreme Court case that lays out the reason, the reasoning for why and how America dominated the indigenous and stole their land, not taught. And this isn't taught either. We have this gentleman, Bhagat Singh Thind, who serves in World War I. He wants to become an American citizen. And he basically says, well, look, under the law, I'm an Aryan because I came from North India, and therefore, I'm a pure blood Aryan. And this is the argument that he tries to make. And the court actually agrees with him at the lower level. They say, according to our own racist genealogy, this is not what they said exactly, but according to our own genealogy and according to our own anthropology and according to our own pseudoscience, yes, you are an Aryan. But the Supreme Court, they basically decided, well, you do not look like a white person the way we understand it, so therefore we cannot classify you as white. Um, this is actually a major problem in American race law and American history that despite white supremacy, the definition of Whiteness itself is always vague and always shifting. And this is what the Supreme Court Justice said, that free white persons need to be uh, interpreted according to the understanding of the common man synonymous with the word Caucasian, only as that word is popularly understood, because actually they lost the argument on the merits. More racially restrictive laws. I mean, the Cable Act gives women the right to retain their citizenship after they get married to non-citizen men. 
Except there's an ex racial restriction that's set up right here. And it says, if you marry an Asian man who's a non-citizen and you're a woman, your citizenship still will be stripped from you until 1930 as well. And the Nazis are studying all this. You know, American race law doesn't just exist on Jim Crow. It exists across the spate of all American laws. If you think of indigenous law, it's colonial law. If you think of segregation laws, those are separate but equal, very strict. Of course, voting laws, immigration laws we discussed, very racially restrictive, all citizenship laws, all marriage laws, and of course, all property laws. All of them have racial restrictions and white supremacy written into them. The big difference that the Nazis understood was that whereas they put it explicitly in their own laws, American judges and jurists had a way of reconciling the 14th Amendment, equality before the law, and racial white supremacy. They found what the Nazis called, quote, devious pathways. They found ways, as you know, you, those of us who are lawyers, we know you can get around anything, but um, they found actual interpretive methodological ways to get around the principle of equality to the point where it really didn't matter. I, I have to quote here uh, John Marshall Harlan, his famous dissent where he says, our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. It's a famous passage that's quoted often in law school. I view it as an aspirational statement that clearly had no basis in reality at the time. And even in the original constitution there were the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments expand equality, of course, but as we'll see, you know, the original Constitution had white supremacy written right into it, and the Nazis understood this. They cited all kinds of American law. And I view this as the core tension in my book, <clears throat> and in my, in my work here, the tension between these two ideas, the emancipatory universal idea and the race-based white supremacist idea. Constitution of the United States, again, much of this is probably familiar to people, but of course the Electoral College is based on white supremacy and protecting slaveholders. Former professor of mine, Akil Rita Mar, has very uh, persuasively argued this, and others, the Fugitive Slave Clause, the Slave Trade Clause, which bans Congress from restricting the international slave trade for 20 years. I mean, these guys really went all the way. And ultimately what this does is it tilts the power of American democracy into the hands of an enslavers, enslavers oligarchy. And this is a provo another provocation I do want to throw out. I'll contend with it in my book, and I welcome any questions on this or any comments on this on whether the white South could be considered fascist. And my argument here is if it seems to have fascist white supremacist laws and it talks like a fascist and a white supremacist, it might be a fascist and white supremacist. Down in the South, we all know this. I was just in Georgia recently. I was in Savannah, Georgia, actually a beautiful city. And right there is a huge Civil War monument and one of the things I was struck by, and commentators note this, is just the, gr the grandness of the monument. It wasn't even to a particular individual, it was just to the Confederates, and the thing just kept going up. And I thought, this is of course a form, to me, I thought fascism right away. So, of course, we, there's other citizenship laws here. Basically, America creates an entirely new citizenship uh, regime as it conquers Puerto Rico, as it conquers the Philippines. It creates second-class citizen, citizenship, third-class citizenship for black people, Native Americans, Puerto Ricans, Filipinos, and all the colonial subjects. A um, point that I do want to emphasize is that the anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic policy of the Nazis doesn't exist in a vacuum. And I mention this because I was at a talk on Monday with the former Attorney General, Mr. Jeffrey Rosen. And it was a talk on anti-Semitism, even though I wanted to ask him about January 6th, because, which we'll get to, because he was the Attorney General at the time. But everyone seemed to just be obtuse to the fact that the President of the United States had said there were very fine people on both sides regarding neo-Nazis, and that there was a longer history here of anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish policy that doesn't begin 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Again, the conversation I felt was very myopic. So conspiracy theory, of course, is tied to anti-Semitism, that a small population controls the world, and media, and finance, etc. Tropes of Jewish success. Jews were less than 0.75% of the German population in 1933. So that was something that was surprising to me as well, that there were roughly, according to the US Holocaust Museum, only roughly around 500,000 Jews living in Germany around the time Hitler ascended to power. So, uh, being small in number really doesn't matter to the white supremacists. And of course, the uncomfortable fact 
going back to my original question of how the West had descended into such savagery and barbarism, is 2,000 years of anti-Semitism repeated at the pulpit day after day, week after week, for centuries and for millennia, repeating the worst tropes of Jewish, uh, anti-Jewish uh, hatred for centuries. And this was in the cultural, intellectual soil of Germany when Hitler assumes power. Of course, we've, we've covered this 500,000 Jews. Uh, another important point that, that was noted in a lot of the research I've been doing was just the severity of the anti-black racism, the severity of the hatred for Eastern races, so-called Eastern races, uh, the targeting of the intellectually challenged, and of course, control over women's bodies. Nazis began to enforce very, very strictly abortion laws uh, in Germany by the September of 1933. Some judges would make exceptions later on for minority women, Jewish women, but it was part of their policy, their family planning policy, their, their policy of control over the state. You must control women's bodies. And this is a recurring theme that the fascists always, always will return to. And of course, the sterilization policy. A lot of this, a lot of this was taken directly from the United States. I want to emphasize this point as well because some might ask why I'm again studying this and emphasizing it. I want to start looking at the ideas of 1933 and how those policies morph over time, right? It, the, the policy of the Nazi party is not extermination in 1933. That's just not factually true. It is deportation, it is segregation, it is exclusion, it is all these other things. But there's a path dependence here, right? We begin by marginalizing a minority, dehumanizing them over and over again in the press. Then we talk about violence against them. Then we can segregate them. Very nearly it leads in all fascist reg regimes to the worst possible outcome, and in this case was, of course, the show up. This is, this is the, the mechanisms that I'm working on, from ideas to action to political momentum to policy, and the idea that policy can and will radicalize and harden over time. So once again, to repeat, Nazism draws from a deeper wellspring of Western ideas, and they keep coming up, the rejection of progress, rejection of exchange of ideas, belief in one-man rule representing the pure race, racism and anti-Semitism, and of course, xenophobia. The Nazis were operating within the Western tradition. It's why their party structure may have gone away, but their ideas have not. Just some factual reminders that before the Nazis came to power, 28 U.S. states passed sterilization laws. Before the Nazis had come to power, more than 15,000 people sterilized in the first wave of this, by the way. Swiss sterilization laws also existed in Nordic countries like Denmark, Norway, um, Switzerland as well. Of course, the literacy test, another racial restriction introduced into the emancipatory idea of American law, Something very interesting about the literacy, literacy test, which we think of as exclusively a post-Civil War implementation in the South, was that it actually started in the North, in Connecticut and in Massachusetts, as a way to racially restrict immigration without explicitly saying so. Right? So this is how you ensure Irish and Italians and others cannot come to your state by introducing a literacy test. And of course, the literacy test from the 1850s then is considered very, very popular uh, in the South and is introduced in a number of states to disenfranchise black people. 30 American states banned mixed marriages before the Nazis came into power, and criminalization of marriage in legal history is very, very rare. So I kind of want to go to this now, because I don't have that much time, but I do want to note how Harvard was complicit in Nazism and in fascism. In 1934, the Harvard class of 1909 welcomed back the, one of its famous alumni who then was serving as Nazi press chief, Ernest Hanfenstangel. The Nazi official came to campus. He had tea with Harvard's president. Two women chained themselves to the Harvard railing. At one point, a local rabbi approached him and accosted him and said, my people want to know, does it mean extermination? Hanfenstangel replied coldly, I'm on vacation, I'm with my old friends. And this reminds me of the many dignitaries and war criminals and various associates of war criminals who pass through elite institutions and everyone just claps and no one asks them a single difficult question. Harvard Crimson denounced the anti-Nazi protest, uh, anti protest as childish. 
And even up until 2005, you see in the Harvard Crimson rationalizations for this, justifications for this. Well, Harvard never explicitly condoned Nazism, but it subscribed to the genteel anti-Semitism that pervaded the elite institutions of the country in the early years of the 20th century. This is from the Third Reich in the Ivory Tower, and those who are interested can read more about it. But I thought that it was particularly disgusting that the Crimson also called for an honorary degree to be given to the individual. The dean of the Harvard Law School as well, very famous individual in the legal academy named Dean Roscoe Pound, big fan of Adolf Hitler and also thinks Hitler should be given an honorary degree. So the point here is the smartest people in the smartest institution where we are sitting as well didn't see it as a problem, right? Perhaps we should, before we even talk about a racist policy or a sexist policy or a misogynistic policy, the first people we should ask are the ones who are going to be impacted by it, not the majority white men who are sitting around making a lot of those policies. If we're going to actually introduce a voice into the narrative, it should be the one who will be impacted by it. Because I can guarantee you there are probably Jews in America at that time when that Nazi was vis visiting who were very, very, very afraid. Lesson number two, platforming the, the far right legitimizes them. Ideas and movements are given credibility, they're given credence, they're given shine by proximity to elite institutions. I'm gonna, I wanna come to the story of now. Because unfortunately, when I, when I came to Harvard, I would have been fine writing a purely historical work, looking at scholarship, looking at law, looking at research. I was reading Democracy in America by Alexis de Tocqueville, and he was writing about the three races and the subjugation of the three races in America. And that was the day that January 6th actually happened. But something closer to home happened as well, because apparently the Nazis haven't gone away. Just a few months ago, right here in our own very neighborhood, neo-Nazis were here assaulting, attacking students, shouting slurs, part of a neo-Nazi outfit called the Nationalist Socialist 131 Crew. Unfortunately, this is not theory. These people didn't go away, they just seem to have reassembled. And even though there is no Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party or an Italian Fascist Party as they existed at the time, their ideas are still with us and very easily retrievable on the internet, by the way. And the more that we, in the sort of mainstream are afraid to tackle these ideas and confront them and challenge them and push back, the more these ideas fester. So this is how you have many, many, too many young white men who are turning into fascists. A recent survey by the ADL found that 85% of Americans believe at least one anti-Jewish trope. 2023 FBI report data shows that hate crimes have reached the highest level since the government began tracking the crimes in the early 1990s. And the true figures are, of course, much higher. Crimes, and quote, crimes against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Sikhs and bisexual people all more than doubled. Meanwhile, hate crimes against black, white, and LGBTQ people made up nearly half of all incidents. Hate crimes against black people specifically make up nearly one third of all reported incidents, the largest category by far. I wrote this piece for the LA Times recently, basically looking at the cultural aspects of fascism. Why is it that young men are turning to this? Why is it they go to Andrew Tate? Why is it they go to, go to these far-right men's rights communities? These are disparate groups, but they share things, and it would be important to look at them as allies in their own struggle for white domination, a struggle that hasn't stopped. A number of them, anti-trans groups, Proud Boys, Men's Rights, 4chan, Andrew, Andrew Tate. There are other names here that I could throw up, but uh, you know, for now, we'll keep those for the Q&A. The fascists are unified by their love of violence, their hatred of progress, and the sinister sense of entitlement that America belongs to them. You know, I put this slide up because maybe there are uh, scholars here who looked at radicalization. It just reminds me of the ISIS problem, actually, in 2015. Even though people don't really treat those two things as parallel, like, if we were to look at the headlines that major American publications had with regards to ISIS in 2015, it was like, why are Muslims becoming terrorists? Why are they becoming radicalized? Is there something in their culture? Is it their religion? And yet, there are a lot of white men in America right now who are becoming fascists and becoming radicalized. So, it's a major, major problem. In fact, in terms of, in terms of scale, the two problems aren't really comparable because there was a small percentage of Muslims who were becoming radicalized, but it seems that a much larger percentage of white people are white men in particular. So again, I wasn't going to avoid this. I wasn't going to come here and talk about fascism and Nazism and not talk about how brown people and black people, indigenous people, people of color, trans people, trans kids, Sikh kids, how all of us have been jeopardized. 
and it keeps happening. It doesn't stop happening, in fact. It's the same story over and over and over again. And what they do is they seem to treat brown and black bodies as expendable, continuously. And it's the same kind of perpetrator also writing the same kind of manifesto around racism, white supremacy, birthright theories, targeting, of course, black people, Jewish people, Muslims, and other minorities, and it does not stop. Symbiosis of street fascists and fascists in suits. This is very, very important because in 1930, it was the same thing. You had the thugs on the street enforcing the law, street justice, street law, and then you had people in the back rooms, and it was the same thing in America. You had Southern Democratic politicians in, Ca in Capitol Hill in the White House, and you also had lynchings on the street and the targeting of black people and other minorities on the street. I want to talk about January 6th very quickly because I read the January 6th report earlier this year, and what I found was a clear and concerted effort to overturn the election. It was a lot worse than I thought, actually. And this, this is important because, you know, I don't want this to be a Trump-centric presentation, but of course, there is a large elephant in the room. And this the January 6th thing is very important because there were clear legal plans, the Eastman plan to not count certain ballots, Trump's direct pressure on states, and then the Trump-Clark plan to take over the DOJ. This is what I spoke to the former attorney general about. Um, he actually didn't want to answer the question, but that's okay. The the President of the United States had planned to fire the Attorney General at the time, replace him with a crony who would then enact out what he had asked to overturn the U.S. election and put Donald Trump in office. The Attorney General declined and threatened that the entire department leadership would resign if the President tried to do this. They actually drafted a letter they were going to send to the swing states from the Department of Justice saying that we can't count your ballots, we have to pause it, basically. And that would have dropped and mired America in a constitutional crisis. <sighs> Again, I can probably show you better than I can tell you. is going to do the right thing. I hope so. I hope so. Because if Mike Pence does the right thing, we win the election. All Vice President Pence has to do is send it back to the states to recertify. And we become president, and you are the happiest people. There are currently dozens of people who are on trial for various crimes, including obstructing an official proceeding and also the rarely charged crime of seditious conspiracy. That's right. Earlier this year, uh, Oath Keeper leaders Elmer Stewart Rhodes, who himself is a far-right fascist who actually graduated from Yale Law School, the same place I went to, uh, 
few years before. And this is gonna be another strand of my work in the way elite institutions have also facilitated a lot of these toxic far-right ideas. Um, Proud Boys are on trial for sedition. Oath Keepers are on trial for sedition. Uh, I hope all of them go to jail for the great disgrace that they brought to this country and for their supporters' disregard for all the rest of us. But I don't think that just simply enforcing the law and throwing them all in jail is gonna be enough. It's an important quote because of who it comes from. You know, this is not coming from Bernie Sanders or AOC or someone that you'd expect on the left, right? This is coming from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's coming from the top military advisor in the White House to President Trump and to President Biden. It's quite worrying when he looks out at January 6th and he says this reminds him of the brown shirts and it is a Reichstag moment, referring, of course, to the Reichstag fire and the Nazi control of the regime. I'm not a fatalist. I don't believe we're destined to repeat the past. I don't believe that we are destined to end up in a fascist country or fascist regime. But I do think right now we're living in a pivotal moment where it could go either way. The fate of democracy could actually go either way. If you look at the cases the Supreme Court has taken up, whether it's independent state legislature theory, which is essentially give state legislatures in the South free reign to write their own election law and disenfranchise black people as they've been trying to do now and doing for the last 50, 60, 100 years. I mean, you can go back to the founding of the country, but the modern conservative movement in the Supreme Court is a radical right-wing movement, as we have seen with the Dobbs decision. They're probably gonna get rid of affirmative action as well. Uh, Justice Thomas, who should be impeached from the Supreme Court and should have been impeached a long time ago, has, uh, has even argued that all of the equal protections in American law should be removed. So all the protections on same-sex marriage. But we do have tomorrow and we do have the next day, and we do have this moment upon us now. And I think that we need to refocus and redouble our efforts on saving American democracy. You know, one of the things that I did during my Radcliffe Fellowship was I started a podcast as a way to have conversations with different people, um, got to interview some of my, my co-fellows and some greats, like Mr. Noam, Professor Noam Chomsky, who said that he too was worried about the fascist threat to the United in the United States. Why does QAnon get large-scale social support? Why do people join these movements? These are important questions, and I think if you look back at the origins, what you find is a substantial breakdown of the social order. And in fact, there was someone he was more afraid of. Fear actually isn't the right emotion. But there was someone he was more worried about and that I am more worried about than Donald J. Trump, and that is the current governor of Florida. The current governor of Florida does espouse a white nationalist message. He does espouse a cultural position of cultural war. He does espouse a position of targeting the most vulnerable population in America, which is trans children right now. He does espouse militarism. He does espouse many of the themes and the ideas that I've seen coming up. The saving grace of Trump is that he's a clown. This man went to Yale and Harvard. So I've got some ideas, and I'm going to hopefully in the last third of my book, I'm going to have interviews with various leaders, activists, members of Congress, their staff, to try and get like the best ideas that we can get on how do you actually save American democracy. And there's some like legislative things, you know, expanding voting rights, that's super important. I think campaign finance reform is super important because otherwise America will always be beholden to private interests. Antitrust enforcement, really important. We're seeing this right now in the monopolization space and tech space. Transparency laws, I think we need to rebuild public trust between people and the government after 20 years of war and lies. It's very, very important. Those of us who have been dealing with, you know, we have research assistants, young people, we know that young people right now are extremely distrustful of government and of policy and of any kind of institutional leader. So transparency laws would help with that, maybe banning the practice of Congress, Congress people trading stocks, which they do often on inside information. And again, creating the sense that America is for everyone. I do think the last point is the most important one, and I'm in a room full of scholars and artists and scientists and writers, and I think that we, and lawyers, we must win the battle of ideas. It's not simply enough for us to say, you know, such and such is an abhorrent view when those views come up and people share them and they keep them private and they come up in, in parties and social situations often. When Trump was elected, I actually did a, felt really guilty because as outspoken as I felt I had been, there were many times when I was in certain rooms where I was quiet 
where something was said, and again, it's maybe like just 10% racist, you know? It's not fully, no one is ever gonna be like full on neo-Nazi in your face, but you sh we should be able to get signs, you know? When someone is talking about the Jews a little bit too much, like you, at this point in our society, any kind of silence I think is complicity, private or public. Enforcing the law, of course, again, coming back to this, I think we need new narratives, we need newer histories, our law schools need to teach accurate, accurately in other cases, not just the usual cases, and we need to really reform our pedagogy. Um, we need to reform our pedagogy to ensure that people are actually learning true history and our values are being passed on. Finally, in a room full of writers, I want to say this, we must, we must, we must focus on the language. There's a great war going on over the language right now, whether it's the word woke, they attack us for being woke, which is just, you know, a term that means you basically you support racial equality and gender equality, right? If that's what being woke is, we should all be woke and awake. Right, if you think of the great battles over trans rights, I mean, it's really not a battle, it's an assault by the state and certain politicians. Th that's also a war over language. Language is going to come up again and again and again in how we define things. And one of the most insidious and dangerous things I learned in my research on Nazi Germany was the way in which propaganda, the leadership, Joseph Goebbels, how they subtly began changing the language, subtly. Over time, like a word would change, you know, pseudonyms would be introduced, uh, vague terms would be introduced, you know, an evacuation when it means it's a deportation camp, uh, a labor camp to refer to an extermination camp. And there's a great book called LTI by a Jewish writer, German Jewish writer from the 1930s, Victor Klemperer, who talked and traced in his diary the ways in which language changed very subtly to the point where one day you wake up a decade later and you don't even have the language to argue for your own liberation. Now that's a point where it's too late. So I would say those of us who are stewards of language and use tools of language, who are writers, even for artists, visual artists, engineers, language is imperative and important to save because there is an assault on language. The minute we lose that, we've lost a core tool of ours. I'm Omar Aziz, thank you for joining me today for this presentation, Fascism in America. I look forward to hearing your questions, thank you. Thank you, Aziz. Yeah. Thank you this for having me. It was a long walk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a change from our usual setting. That's great. Uh, we have lots of questions. So the first one is, halting this wave of fascism is fundamental, as history shows clearly where it ends. Some propose tackling the roots by fighting inequality and poverty and ensuring that no one is left behind. Can you give an example of a country that is already doing this or has done this successfully? I mean, I think the welfare state where I grew up in Canada was interesting because, you know, one of the things I've, like, just having public, good public schools and having good public health care, I think can save people from falling into certain traps. Especially young men, if you don't have a job, if you don't have any kind of stability, you have no stable relationships, you have nothing in the society, you're just kind of like wayward and more people are just wayward from any kind of institution any kind of family structure, any kind of relationship, they're just wayward individuals. It becomes much easier to then descend into like far right rabbit holes. And of course, they're waiting for you, right? They're waiting for us. The algorithms, YouTube, on Twitter and stuff, it's very easy to find this stuff and to go down these rabbit holes. So I think like having um, more education, more access to education is good. It will inure certain people from the fascist threat, but it's only a part of the solution, I think. Mm -hmm. What can you say about the rise of right-wing feminism and nationalist women taking power? <clears throat> That's really interesting. You know, white women, over 50%, did support Donald Trump. I do think that there's going, there's more right-wing, uh, I don't know if I would call them feminists in particular, but there's more right-wing women who are turning to fascism in the far right. And I mean, look at the uh, current Italian prime minister as well, uh, neo-fascist. So this is coming up. I think. There are the other side of the white men who are supporting fascism as well, right? Like, they probably don't want women of color to rise. They probably aren't supportive of same-sex marriage. They probably aren't. So it's the exact same ideology. And the fascist ideology crosses races and genders too, right? It's not limited. So if certain traditionally elite, powerful, powerful white women think that the power structure is no longer serving them, 
then instead of supporting a more equal and just structure, even though they've been oppressed by that structure, they then become like transform into supporting fascism as well in the far right. And um, more and more women I've seen are becoming influencers as well, far right influencers, particularly in Europe. And I think that we gotta communicate directly to them as well. I think um, that's, that's dangerous and worrying. And touching on another point here, can we speak uh, more to the role of technology mm. in supporting the cultural aspects of fascism and organizing? Are tech companies complicit? Yes, I think so. I think especially now with Twitter and other tech companies, I think continually feeding us outrage and taking us down these rabbit holes and platforming and elevating the worst kind of ideologies in a profit maximizing space that then corrupts and contaminates you know, a young person's mind with these ideas and indoctrinates them and radicalizes them, that's a major problem. I mean, you look at TikTok, for example, right? Like TikTok in Canada, um, in the West, in America and Canada and other countries basically just feeds kids garbage all day long, you know, on endless loop. And it's a very powerful um, algorithm. And there's a lot of uh, far right hate on TikTok as well. But TikTok in China, there's like, you know, filters already set up, like kids are given educational content. And again, does this mean I support the state intervening and setting up filters? No, but it means we can create certain algorithms and structures that are more beneficial for our society rather than harmful, that, that polarize us, make us hate each other, fear each other, and allows a far right wing agitator to basically pit us against each other and win power. And remember, America's ruled, uh, Despite all the oppression of minorities, America rules by minority power, which is to say you don't need 50% of the vote to win. You don't need 51% of the vote to win. You can, all, you, you can win power by having 45, 46, 47% of the vote and winning certain swing states. You can become president that way. So with only just by appealing to a small base in this country, you can actually win full power. And that's why you know, it's extremely worrying and we need to be thinking about how do we create these structures that benefit us all and inform us, educate us, enlighten us, and not just pit us against each other and make us full of hate and susceptible to right-wing, far-right fascist ideologies. Mm -hmm. How do we, I mean, following up mm -hmm. on what you just said, how do we stop societal enablers that contribute to creating the fertile grounds for a neo-fascistic political movement to flower in the United States or any other country? Could you repeat the question? How do we stop creating the- How um, do we stop enablers? <clears throat> you know, I think of these like concentric circles, like at the very far end might be, you know, the intellectual right-wing fascist and closer might be the person who's like an activist and then the closer into the circle is the person who's gonna be actually taking the guns to the Capitol and the closer into the circle and all these people kind of work together, you know, whether they realize it or not. And I think for the enablers on the outside, for the intellectual supporters and for the professors, we again have to make sure that we're contending and responding to those ideas. I mean, Charles Murray came and spoke at Yale when I was there as well. It was like, you know, there was a lot of protest, there was a lot of back and forth, there was a lot of heat, but no one actually just challenged his arguments and said a lot of this is BS. A lot of this doesn't make sense, a lot of this isn't based in truth, it's just eugenics repackaged and claiming that black people are genetically less intelligent. And again, there are all these, remember the devious pathways. As we know, there's ways that like thinkers can get around being explicitly racist. And for those of us who are also thinkers and writers, we have to make sure we challenge them on it and, and respond in kind as well. Um, I also think for younger people, like this is our world now, you know? This is our world. Like we're gonna have to live in the consequences of this world. So if you hear something and you don't say something, or if you see something and you don't say something or do something, then that's a burden that you're gonna have to bear and the rest of us are gonna have to bear as well. It's not one that I wanna bear any longer. I think that when any of these ideas, thoughts, they do come up, if you hear something, you must say something. I mean, it's, it's, it's only another person for so long. Very, very quickly, it'll be you. Hmm. Um, there are a few questions about la language. Sure. Um, Let's see if I can find it again. <laughs> um, yes. How can we be more aware of changes in language and how do you reverse engineer language? Mm -hmm. And also there is another question about your position on hate speech, mm -hmm. whether it should be limited or otherwise. No, I mean, I think that we shouldn't, I don't actually think we need too many new laws. 
And I do think I'm, I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to advocate for passing new, new laws because any kind of enforcement mechanism or law that's passed, it's very, 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 very quickly it can be transformed into another tool to be used against black and brown people, right? I think we have enough laws on the books. Like America has enough laws to prosecute all of these crimes for the most part. Um, so I think we can continue enforcing hate speech and maybe you know, it should be an aggravating factor if, if a murder is committed and there's a hate speech involvement or an assault is a, is a motivator that's determined, then you know, that, that, that should ag aggravate the sentence and make it a more severe crime. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm not in favor of, of passing a slew of new legislation. And then the earlier question was? Um. It was about, I'm reading another Oh, language. Language, yes. It was about language. Uh, I, I think that the actual battle for a lot of these ideas is over the terrain of language, and I think of what I actually hear around me, you know, like these terms like white privilege or woke culture or all these things that are like used by the right to basically, they, they don't even have an argument, they just keep repeating it and repeating it and then trying to like make it seem like, you know, if you're woke, that's a bad thing. And I think we should contest them on their first principles. What's wrong with being awake? What's wrong with supporting racial equality? What's wrong with supporting uh, a dignity and decent life for workers, you know? Like, if it makes me woke to think that, you know, an ordinary American person who's working at McDonald's struggling, that the government should think about them as well, then call me woke. Like, that's the energy we need. We have to stop apologizing also, right? Those of us on the left, on progressive, we're so apologetic and we're arguing on the terms set by the right. And elite institutions often can foster this, you know, imposter syndrome for minorities. You make it into the room and they expect you to be quiet. I think that we have to leave that all behind now. We have to aff affirmatively make our case and do it with pride and do it boldly and not subscribe to their terms because we will lose. And also the vast majority of Americans and Canadians, including white people, I think they would agree with me. They would agree that we have a racist past. They would agree that we need to do more. They would agree that the system is too set up and rigged for elite interests. They would agree with these things. And if you just look at where we are in terms of inequality, the worst inequality since the Gilded Age, you know, like it's, it's, it's quite obvious. And many of these ideological movements are symptoms of the breakdown of our social order, as Professor Chomsky was saying. Mm -hmm. One last question, which is on the personal side. How did you go from writing a memoir, how and why, from writing a memoir to a historical nonfiction project like the one you've described? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think um, I wanted something just like the memoir was so personal and required such a personal excavation of like memories and, and, and incidents in the past and anecdotes that I really wanted to go in a completely different direction with this book. There might be some memoiristic elements, some reporting pieces where I, ha where I do introduce uh, the I, but for the most part, this is a work on like ideas and reporting and just like looking at how we have descended into this, into this moment. Uh, I find the ideas part quite invigorating. I find that, you know, going into this Nazi fascist stuff, it doesn't give me any kind of pleasure or joy. It's not something that I want, but I, I, I view this book as more of a service too, right? Like I think this idea has grasped me, this question has grasped me. It, yes, it does have to do with a subject considered the epitome of evil, but it happened in, in our time in, and it's happening now and it happened in history. So I wanted to tackle it directly and try and make some sense of it and to formulate an argument, right? Like I genuinely do think we are living in a fascist moment and an assault upon democracy and I think this book and this project, this research is one way, just one way, to shine some light and perhaps have some sense of what do we do next. Thank you, Omer. Thank, thank you for, for your presentation me. and for your perspectives. I want to thank the audience for uh, listening and for your questions. Um, I hope you'll be able to join us for other public events. You can find them at radcliffe.harvard.edu, where you can also find videos of past events. Thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye.